Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And thank you so much to Mark Spenda, uh, who is here with us from South Bend, Indiana. And Mark has an MFA from the University of Chicago and a BA from DePaul. Mark is also the curator at the South Bend Museum of Art, which is how I first met him. And, yes. and later, uh, when I got hip, I started following him on Instagram and seeing the great works that he was making and got excited about bringing his work to Ripon College. Happily, he agreed to come and has been as delightful to work with as his work is to look at. I hope that those of you that are able to be on campus with us this semester will go down to the Castiger Gallery in the Rodman Center for the Arts and see his work for yourself. I say see and not touch um, because as you'll see, all this work is made with paper pulp. So. With that, um, Mark, I know you have a lot to share with us, so I'll let you take it away. Yeah, probably too much. And as you can see, it's very dark in South Bend, so I'm going to do my best. Actually, somehow I slipped into uh, the set for Twin Peaks, but I had my computer with me, so I can still do this presentation. So anyway, I just want to start by saying thank you, Molly. Thank you to Ripon College. What a wonderful uh, experience this has been. What a wonderful opportunity to share a whole new body of work and, um, and, and, and some older pieces in a new way. And uh, just I know that there's probably some students that are here and maybe some faculty. I just want to you know, tip my hat to you for making it through this really incredibly crazy year. Um, so thank you. And so what I did was I put together a PDF, which is way too many pages. So Molly's going to keep an eye on the clock and she'll give me a little prod if I'm going too long. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. And I'm sharing now. And we're going to go, I'm sharing, right? Yes, you are. OK, thank you. And we're going to go to full screen mode. OK, so welcome to my Ripon College PDF presentation. Um, and I started this out with a few images of some drawings that aren't in the show, just to give you a sense of what some of my work looks like outside of what the show is. So it's just to give you a little bit of context. And I, I think of drawing as the core of my practice. And these are works on paper that are pencil on paper, graphite on paper, and cut paper inlay, which means that while it looks collaged, the drawings are actually completely flat. I'm just going to try and speed this up because there's a lot I want to get to. Um, Oh, the, well, that one's not flat, obviously. Um, so, but, and I don't want to go into like the full overall, like, you know, I started drawing with crayons when I was a little kid. Um, I, I, but I do want to, I do think it's important to mention that since about 2011, my work has been made in relation to the Gubbio Studiolo. And the Gubbio Studiolo, and this is like the quick elevator uh, rundown of it was commissioned by this guy, Duke Federico de Montefeltro. Um, that's his wife. And he commissioned it in, there he is reading it in full plate armor, which is very comfortable, I'm sure. So actually Gubbio is in, where is it? Right there, it's in the calf of the boot. And he was the Duke of Gubbio and earned his money uh, a lot of it through uh, basically renting out his army to different factions during the time. And this is his palace. And so this is the Gubbio Studiolo. So this was made circa 1478 to 1482. And it's a room on permanent exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I would encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to go and see it. Um, it's really remarkable. What it is, is all done in intarsia, which is a form of marquetry. 
So when you're standing in the room, it looks like there's these three dimensional elements, but it's all just inlaid wood, different colors of inlaid wood that make things look three dimensional. It's all Trump Loy. And to me, it creates this interesting space of being three dimensional, vibrating between three dimensions and two dimensions, between a, a real physical presence in your real physical world and something that extends into like a contemplative and uh, mental uh, space. Um, it's really just super amazing. You know, flipping through these and not doing them justice. But one of the things that it was made for was to show off how much money he had and how much power he had, that he could commission this beautiful room. The other thing that it was commissioned for was to be an aid to associative thinking. So the thing that was really interesting to me was that this room was made so that the Duke could stand in the center of it and let his mind wander and free associate to all these different elements. And he might make different connections between ideas that he wouldn't have made if he wasn't standing in the room. So the, that was the other element of this space that was really intriguing to me that it was a physical space that was made as a tool for thinking. So ever since that point, I've been working on drawings and sculptures that stem from that as a loose sense of inspiration that this is the wall in my studio. Um, and I work on all these drawings at the same time. And what I do is I'll put one on top of the other and cut through both. And then you end up with two shapes that are exactly the same shape. And then I transpose them. And then they, they make their way into new drawings. So I've been doing that for a while. And th th at a certain point, I started thinking, well, this is an incredibly time consuming process. What if I could fast forward time and cut into the paper 10,000 times or 100,000 times? And eventually it would become paper pulp. It would return to what it was before it became paper. So I started working in paper pulp uh, to create sculptures that have some sort of relationship to the drawings and different ideas that I have in the drawings as well. Now, what you're seeing here is an exhibition that I had not too long ago. Uh, I believe this opened, it was either September or, or October last year at the Buchanan Art Center in Buchanan, Michigan. The first thing I noticed when I went into this space was that it, re it made me think immediately of a library. And as it turned out, the building was originally built as a library. So, and I've loved libraries my whole life. So I wanted to create basically a love letter to libraries. And I, I created these paper pulp two by fours and the paper pulp two by fours spell roughly the word ex libris. So you see an E here, there's an X, there's an L somewhere, um, but trust me, they're all there. And then I also created these paper pulp books and there's plants paper plants that are all part of it. Um, and I was really happy with how it turned out. But then, so Molly offered me this exhibition at Ripon College and I was, I, I had been thinking about this show at Buchanan for so long, I wasn't really certain what I was going to do for Ripon College. And I, I thought, well, I could redo the library piece. Um, because my love for libraries isn't going away. And that's kind of what I was thinking of doing, but then things changed. So the morning of November 4th, 2020 was the morning that we, or at least I woke up. I woke up to a text from my brother that said, you might want to take a drink before take check in the news today. Um, and that was when things looked like Trump was going to win the presidency. And I just felt shaken to my core that I would be living through this again. And then not long after that, January 6th, which is what we're seeing here, where Trump supporters and conspiracy supporters 
stormed the Capitol building in Washington, DC, and six people were killed. So I'm moving it ahead because I, that image is so disturbing to me. Um, but I, the, what those days did was it brought me back to how I felt uh, it was November 8th, um, November 8th, 2016, when Trump was elected president of the United States or originally. And I just, I, co I couldn't fathom how that was happening, how this man was actually elected to be president of the United States. And I literally felt like I was inside of a Twilight Zone episode um, that I just couldn't, I couldn't match what I felt reality was to those people who felt like he would be a good president. And I felt like there was this split and we've seen this split in the way people believe things growing um, throughout, you know, at least the last 10 years, probably longer than that. Uh, as everybody is on Facebook and news is becoming decentralized more and more, people are consuming the news from any source that they wish. Um, Facebook, you can make friends with the people that have the same beliefs as you, and that's easier to take in than it is to see a dissenting opinion to what you already believe. And the more that you take in of the, the repeated intake of those opinions just reinforces your own opinion. So it becomes harder and harder for you to see the other side's perspective for better or worse, whichever side you're on. It's a problem for everybody in this country that we cannot communicate. So what I wanted to do was to create some sort of installation that commented on this split that I felt. Um, and for me, that came down to truth that for me, reality is reality. Like science, science is science. You can't, you can't argue with science, but people do. And so wh where, where do you hold on to? If you can't hold on to science as a fact, what are you going to hold on to? What is your truth? So I reuse these paper pulp two by fours to create a structure that is very incomplete or it's falling apart. Um, it nearly fell apart when we installed it. <laughs> Which, that's why this pedestal is here. So you get the inside information because you're listening to the artist talk. Um, it's helping to hold this up. And so the, the two by four structure spells the word truth. You can see the T right here. This is part of an R. There's a U on this side, and then there's a T back here and an H. So it spells truth as you go around it. And I'm gonna start going through some of these images. And the books are not there arbitrarily. They do carry over from the Buchanan show. But all these books are books, they're made to the same size as books that I have in my own library at my home. Um, so this I feel is like, this is my truth. These, these, this is the intake, the, the facts and the information that I've taken in. This is a visual representation of that. So this helps to form and hold up my truth. And as you walk around, you see that there's these plants, there's things growing. And then there's also drawings on the, these wall structures. And you see the back of them because I felt like if the show is gonna be about truth, I don't want things to be hidden. So I want you to be able to see how these images are composed, how they're actually put together physically and how sort of tenuous they are there. I mean, it's inlaid paper and it's held together with tape. And these are some other views. This is a drawing I made specifically for this exhibition. Uh, it's called, oh, what did I call it? Incredulity after Caravaggio, I believe. And the inspiration I used for this 
was this painting by Caravaggio, The Incredulity of St. Thomas, where St. Thomas didn't believe that Jesus had re risen from the tomb and said, well, let me stick my finger in him and then I'll believe. So that's what's going on there. And it's just, this painting is always stuck with me. It's just so gruesome. Like if you imagine that, oh, yay, yay. Um, but what a beautiful painting. Caravaggio really knows how to make your stomach turn. Um, here I have a, it looks abstract at first, but when you look at it at an angle, it becomes a skull, which is um, anamorphic perspective which is taken directly from this painting by Hans Holbein the Younger, the ambassadors from 1533. And there you see the skull. I actually made this skull to be the same scale. I figured I did the math and figured out the same scale to make that skull. And what I love about it is how it's at like a different plane. Like the skull kind of recedes back this way, whereas the wall is this way and you're looking at it from, it's just this weird intersection of these different planes of looking and perspectives um, that has always intrigued me. And this piece right here is called Already There. And that was actually inspired by uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is all about, um, well, it's about aliens. Uh, but it's also about communism and you don't know who's a communist and who's not a communist uh, and the kind of anxiety and doubt that you feel about others. Uh, it's all portrayed in this 1956. This is Kevin McCarthy there. He's setting one of the pods on fire. So that's what I based this pod on. And this piece was... It didn't make it into the show, but I wanted to include it here. So at least it gets its, its due. This is, um, I think I called it Truth after Berenstain Bears. Berenstain Bears. Um, and this is the original image. So I never knew about this uh, before, but the, the Berenstain Bears uh, is an example of the mandala effect that I grew up and in my brain, I firmly believe that it was the Berenstain Bears, but it's actually the Berenstain Bears. Um, whoops. And when I first found that out, I was like, no. And it, it shook me in a way that was reminiscent to the way that I felt shaken in 2016 and again in 2020 and again in 2021. Um, for something so trivial as a, a children's book series, but to, to have this, some, this something that felt like such a fact, like I know it's the Berenstain Bears and it's actually the Berenstain Bears. Uh, 1984, so also I included here some images that were going to become other things, but because I decided on this avenue for this exhibition kind of late in the game, um, when you think about January and that's only the beginning of April now, I didn't have a whole lot of time. So these were other images that could have made their way into other artworks that would have been part of the show, but I included them here just to give a sense of these are some other things that were going through my mind as I worked towards the exhibition. Here is, um, I've never actually seen the movie, but this is the movie of the book 1984 by George Orwell. Um, here we have Henry Fuseli, uh, 1781, Oil on Canvas. Uh, oh, I forgot the title. It's called The Nightmare. I believe that's the full title. Um, because some of this past year has just felt like that. Uh, the Matrix, which pill do you take? Um, this was NBC News, and this was the first time that Kellyanne Conway spoke the words alternative facts, uh, which has now become part of the lexicon. Um, X-Files, I want to believe, I just love that poster. I love the show, and the show itself deals with conspiracy and government cover-ups, and who do you believe, what do you believe? Um, and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, just 
Facebook, there's much good that Facebook does and there's much evil that has come of it too as well, including this siloing of perspectives and people getting their news through Facebook uh, without checking the source, uh, the, the reality of fake news, which is a weird thing to say. Um, all these things come about because of his invention. And then, of course, the Twilight Zone. Uh, this is the Twilight Zone that I always think of. This is the one that I kind of grew up with, which was, it was before my time, but this is the one that I would see on TV and these different elements of the uh, intro to it. And I was definitely gonna do a drawing with the eyeball and I never got to it. So, that, oh, geez. You know, this is what happens when you do this in a rush and you work on things like last minute. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> guess, um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions for me? <laughs> if you have questions, you can type them in the chat or the Q&A. And hopefully I made sense and I'm happy to go back. Like I, I went over a lot of information super fast. So if anybody has any questions about any of that, I'm happy to go back to it. Oh, and I can stop sharing. Right, right. Should I stop sharing? Yeah, you can stop sharing, I think. Um, okay. First question is a great one. I was thinking something similar. Um, economics professor Haugi asks, what does perspective mean to you in this context? Because I think you were talking about perspective, but also perspective. Yeah, not just about the perspective of creating an image and creating depth within an image, but perspective more so, the perspective that we have, the way that we view the world, the way that we view reality, that's more so what it is. And we have another question that asks, could you tell us a bit about how you make 3D structures from paper pulp? Oh yeah, I cheat. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So I learned in an exhibition, I was telling Molly about this earlier, uh, there was an exhibition that I was in that was in a, an old empty factory building. And um, there was no, environmental controls and it was the middle of summer and all the sculptures that I included in the show they all moved because they all soaked up humidity and then they all just started sagging and moving in different ways which was great but from that I learned that if I wanted to create a structure like this I needed there needs to be some sort of core otherwise it's gonna sag and fall apart um, so the way that I cheat for the two by fours is I cut foam to the scale of two by fours and then I coat it with the paper pulp. Just don't tell anybody. The secret is safe with us and everyone <laughs> with the Zoom and YouTube link to this recording. Yes. I have a really great question here in the chat because I think it goes back to what you were talking about as as your inspiration for doing this inlay and Tarja work, is there a place you like to go to get inspiration or a place that makes you feel creative? Hmm. That is a very good question. I feel very creative. You know, I don't know why. At first, this felt like a cop out answer, but you know, I don't think it really is. But it, you know, for the, the job that I do that pays the bills is I work at the South Bend Museum of Art and I work with creative colleagues, really amazing colleagues, and I work with amazing, amazing artists all the time. And they all have different ways of thinking about their work and thinking about like everyone has different ideas that they're contending with. And I feel like working with them, I get the opportunity to delve a little bit deeper into what their ideas are and how they think about things than I would if I went to just see an exhibition at some other museum. Um, so I actually get a lot of energy and uh, creative juice from working with other artists in that aspect. 
That's great. I think um, our art historian is going to love that you said from, you know, from a museum is where you get. Where you get your of course. <laughs> um, this question, I think, is getting to the idea of um, of your process, too, but how you how you moved on to doing inlays with paper after seeing um, those wood inlays and those old paintings like you know how did you how did you get to paper i think so paper for me i was actually doing some inlaid paper drawings before i knew about the gubbio studiolo and it was in a it was in graduate school and there was a, a professor that said hey do you have you ever seen the gubbio studiolo so then I looked it up and I learned about it. Um, but I, I stuck with the paper because it's all around us. It seems much more a part of everyday life and our everyday experience than wood inlay is. Like I don't see wood inlay unless I specifically go out to look for it. But paper, there's paper right there and over there. It's everywhere. Um, and I love that. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, and it's a mode of communication, whereas you don't use um, wood inlay to like, you know, type up a memo. Okay. The next question comes from Professor uh, Rafael Salas. Hey, Rafael. He says, I love the mystery you create with your own struggle with what truth is or what truth could be. Do you address your artwork to those who believe differently? Do you imagine that the audience seeing this artwork um, or you know, what the viewers might see or feel when they, when they see the work? That's a really great question, Raphael. Thanks. Um, I don't make it, I'm making it for myself. And I don't, I'm not making it to change anybody's minds. Um, whereas I have very strong beliefs about what I, <laughs> about the past year and the past four years. I don't want my artwork to fall into the realm of propaganda or um, something like that. What, what I basically, I think this show ended up being like um, kind of like therapy for me. It was sort of me dealing with and contending with this idea of there being these different realities that we're all walking in at this point, which when I say that, it sounds so crazy, but at the same time, it's true. Um, yeah, so I think I'm actually going to keep up with these ideas for a while yet, um, which is just kind of crazy to me. I, that <laughs> there I go with that word. Um, that uh, I never saw myself making political work up until I felt like I needed to make it, and. It just didn't seem like the right time to be thinking about, you know, libraries. Not that libraries aren't great, but it just seemed like this is something that I needed to do. It seems like you're coming at it kind of obliquely. Like, if if we want to read about it or hear about it um, or puzzle it together, we might see these these letters that say truth in your work. Um, but we, we might also just look at the aesthetics of mm -hmm. the work or the recognizable um, pieces of it. I feel now like I'm slipping into your twilight zone as it's getting darker here. It is. We're both floating heads now. <laughs> <laughs> I started this off looking normal, but um, I have a question here and I, I think it's kind of an interesting one because I got to see you making repairs and also assembling the work. The student asks, um, how long does it take to make, make the pulp and once it's dry to put it together? So the pulp, so for a while my daughter was eating a lot of, um, it was a Greek god is a Greek goddess yogurt 
So we had a lot of those yogurt containers. So I, I that's my mode of measurement is Greek goddess yogurt containers. So when I, I make, uh, so what I do is I, I'll gather the paper, I'll sort it into the colors, different colors that I, I want to sort of aim towards. The color is always a bit of a surprise, um, but I'll sort it to try and direct it. And then I'll shred it, put it in a five gallon bucket, fill it with water and let it sit and soak. And then I mix it up with a uh, paint mixer. And then I put it in a blender and I don't have like a Hollander beater, unfortunately. So I'm just putting it in an Osterizer blender. So to get through a five gallon bucket can take anywhere from like uh, two to three hours maybe of just blending it and then squeezing out the excess water and then throwing the pulp into these Greek goddess containers. And then each one of those two by fours it's the, the foam core and then it takes, and then I mix the pulp with glue. That's the other step. Each one of those two by fours takes about two of the Greek goddess containers to um, cover on each side. So I'll do one side, let it dry, flip it, do the other side, flip it. It takes a while, it'll take like four nights to do one board. It is. And it's a, it's about an hour I mean, to do the, the wide portion, one side. So, so it takes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just takes a long time. Okay, well, we're at about a half an hour. So I'll just um, end the recording and thank everyone again for joining us um, live and watching the recording and thank Mark so much for coming to um, Ripon or bringing his work to Ripon um, to share it with us. So thanks everyone. Well, thank you, Molly. Thank everybody for being here. And thanks again to Ripon College and everybody of the, the Ripon community. This has been such a great experience. I hope you enjoy the show and um, I'm looking forward to coming back and spending a little bit more time in the town when I can be a little more relaxed.